So thank you all. Welcome to A Tale of Two Crises, COVID-19 and the Overdose Emergency, part of the Distant Not Disengaged event series. My name is Doug Hamilton Evans, he, him pronouns, and I work at SFU Public Square, one of the hosting organizations. Before I begin, I wish to acknowledge that I joined this conversation as an uninvited guest on the unceded traditional territories of the Lekwungen peoples, specifically the Songhees, and it has disproportionately harmed indigenous peoples, as have our drug laws and policies since their inception. I also acknowledge that indigenous peoples have been at the forefront in social movements that have been instrumental in affecting reforms through our drug policies that center human rights and public health. For anyone who wants to know more about the indigenous land they live on, we recommend checking out Whose Land at www.whose.land. And for those of you joining us from the land currently known as British Columbia, I would also like to recommend the First Peoples Map of BC, a living online map of indigenous languages, cultures, and practices built from community data. You can find it at maps.fpcc.ca. I'd like to remind everyone that closed captioning is available for today's event for all the audio in the plenary. You can turn it on and off by clicking the CC button on the black bar at the bottom of your screen and it should be on your right. And we are thankful to AI Media for partnering with us to provide this service. For those of you who have been to a distant, not disengaged event before, welcome back. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and let us know what events you've been to before. Um, actually, I recommend and encourage everyone to introduce, the, introduce themselves in the chat. You can let us know your name, the pronouns you prefer, uh, whose land you're on and sort of what brought you here. For those of you who haven't been with us before, Distant Not Disengaged is a weekly experimental online community event series launched in response to COVID-19 and the issues and inequities it has surfaced. It is designed to help people connect even as we physically distance from each other. We hold it every Thursday at this time and do our best to share the insights, information and resources that come up in these dialogues after the event itself. Distant Not Disengaged is a collaborative project organized by SFU Public Square, SFU's Morris J. Wask Center for Dialogue, and City Hive. For today's event, we have also partnered with SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement and SFU's Community Engaged Research Initiative. You can find us all on social media under these handles on the screen, and you can loop into the conversation online with the hashtag Distant Not Disengaged and sign up for any of our newsletters to stay on top of all our upcoming events and projects. Now, before we begin, I'd like to reiterate the community guidelines that you should have received when you registered for this event. We've established these to try to ensure a safer, welcoming, inclusive space for discussion. First off, for a fair, honest, and accountable dialogue, we ask that you provide your full name and your display name. Um, you can make any changes to your display name by clicking on participants in the black bar at the bottom, finding your name on the list on the side, hovering over more on the right and going to rename. You can also just click on the little video screen your face is in and find a similar rename button. If you need help, just reach out to anyone with the word tech help in their display name. We have zero tolerance for hate speech and anyone that promotes harm against others in any way or targets someone based on their race, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, religious affiliation, or ability will be removed. There's a lot of pain and vulnerability in this topic and comments that do not respect the humanity and the rights of people who use drugs or experience addiction will result in removal. We ask that you be as present as you can for this conversation. We know there are so many conflicting interests and screens on your desk and devices, but we hope that you can give this conversation and the speakers as much attention as you can. So put down your phone, close your other tabs, pause your Slack notifications. We hope that you can turn your video on for breakout room discussions and turn your video off as our speakers are talking to kind of keep the focus on them. Please add your questions and comments in the chat throughout the session. We will work to direct as many of these to the speakers as we can. And if you have a question or comment for a specific speaker, type in at and their name at the beginning of the post. Please don't assume pronouns or gender knowledge about a person based on their name or video image. Our team has put our preferred pronouns in brackets after our names in the display names, and you can do the same by clicking the participants button or hovering over your video window. We ask that you step up and step back. 
we encourage those of you who don't always get a chance or feel comfortable contributing to weigh in. And if you are someone who often contributes a lot to these conversations, either vocally or in the chat, please make sure to allow space for others to join in as well. Lastly, um, practice self-care. If you need a break, a glass of water, a coffee, a smoke, please go for it. This can be a difficult conversation and can unearth traumas. So please do whatever you need to, to look after yourself. And final reminder, closed captioning is available for this event. You can turn it on and off by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you to AI Media. So our event today is structured pretty simply. In just a moment, you will all be sent to a breakout room with a handful of other guests for a quick five minute chat about what brought you here to this conversation. Um, there will be no official facilitator for this. We just try to insert a few of the real life moments of in-person events to these conversations and Personally, we just miss the chance to meet and connect with others as the room fills in. So we're hoping to kind of do that here. After that, we will reconvene. I will hand things over to our host for today's discussion, Am Jo Hall, who will take it from there. And we'll introduce our speakers and moderate a discussion with them and you about the state of the overdose crisis, its relationship to COVID-19, the calls for safe supply and decriminalization, and what has and can be done to end this ongoing public health emergency. So with that, I think uh, we can start the breakout rooms. Please enjoy these conversations and I'll see you in about five minutes. With that, it's my privilege to introduce our moderator for today, Am Joe Hall. Am is the director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement, the co-director of SFU's Community Engaged Research Initiative, and the host of the Below the Radar podcast, which I thoroughly recommend. Previously, and worked on the Vancouver Agreement, a collective effort to address urban economic and social development. He was also involved in community organizing with the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users in the 90s during previous health crises, and he's advised on two provincial cabinet ministers. So, Am, thank you very much for joining us today, and please take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Doug. I'm really happy that there's so many people here as uh, part of this uh, conversation. It's very important. Uh, that we continue these conversations even in this time. Uh, in the late 90s, I can remember uh, attending uh, meetings that were organized by people like Anne Livingston and Bud Osborne related to the public health crisis um, at that time and uh, the political mobilization that happened, including uh, meetings with uh, cabinet ministers in Victoria. Uh, more people are dying in BC from the contaminated uh, drug supply than at any time since the crisis was declared a public health emergency in, in 2016. 175 people died in June, surpassing the previous record of 171 the previous month, and at least 5,731 people have died since uh, 2016. Uh, these aren't just numbers, but they're human lives and uh, trying to uh, look at this issue as a, a, from a health and human rights uh, point of view, uh, rather than uh, from a, a policing uh, perspective. Uh, the increase in deaths can be seen as an unintended consequence of our response to the other public health crisis of, of COVID-19 as borders have closed. Uh, drug traffickers have pushed a more contaminated uh, product onto the, the market, which has had devastating uh, consequences on the ground. Uh, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police called on the federal government to decriminalize the possession of small amounts of uh, illegal drugs for personal consumption. And it follows the call that many from uh, Dr. Ben Bonnie Henry to uh, social activists have been uh, calling for uh, since, the, since the 90s. Uh, the provincial government supports decriminalization, but says it's a federal responsibility. The federal government says they're committed to evidence-based uh, responses, but is not uh, committed to decriminalization. And so uh, we have a number of panelists uh, with us today that are going to help uh, get, uh, kickstart this conversation. And I really view this as the beginning of a conversation uh, because I think there's going to need uh, far more public dialogue uh, going into the fall if we're going to move the dial on, on public policy. Uh, Susan Boyd is a distinguished professor in the Faculty of Human and Social Development at the University of Victoria. She's also the author of a number of articles and books on drug issues, including Busted, an Illustrated History of Drug Prohibition in Canada. 
Garth Mullins is a drug user activist and award-winning radio documentarian. He's the host and executive producer of Crackdown Podcast, where drug users cover the drug war as war correspondents. Uh, I really recommend checking out uh, the wonderful podcast that uh, Garth is involved with. Angel Gates is a facilitator with the Megaphone Speakers Bureau and from the Haida Nation. She's a proud mother of three amazing kids, been a dog owner for five years. Uh, when she's not doing work as a storyteller with the Megaphone uh, Speakers Bureau, she's an actress and has twice been nominated for, for Best Actress. Dr. Mark Lissitian works for Vancouver Coastal Health as the Deputy Chief Medical Health Officer and Medical Health Officer for Vancouver uh, and the North Shore. Uh, I'm going to uh, throw out a few uh, guiding questions just to get started, and each of our uh, uh, guests will speak for about five minutes each, but, uh, and then we'll move on to, to questions uh, from there. Uh, how can we muster, uh, uh, given the increased momentum behind calls for the safe supply of drugs and the decriminalization of drugs in the face of a worsening crisis, like to ask you these uh, questions. How can we muster a similar energy to ad address uh, this uh, contamination, drug contamination crisis as we have with COVID-19 and why haven't we? What does safe supply and decriminalization really mean and what do they look like? And how do we better support uh, drug policy. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, for Susan Boyd to help uh, kick things off. So welcome, Susan. For your wonderful introduction to the topic today, um, I'd like to start off with saying that the Second public health emergency, you know, in response to COVID-19, I think blatantly brought to the forefront how our two public health emergencies were being dealt with so differently. The overdose death crisis that we've been experiencing since 2010 and earlier um, in Canada, but especially in BC and Vancouver, the rollout in relation to supports and changes in policy were much less than what we saw in relation to federal and provincial policy changes to address COVID-19. And so I think it brought our attention once again to the overdose crisis and what is um, determining this slow response. But I wanted to bring our attention to sort of the history that shaped drug control in Canada and why some ideas around drugs and the people who use drugs, colonization are so deeply entrenched in Canadian policy. And I wanted to start off with a quote from James Baldwin, who's actually an American. He's a US writer and social critic who's passed away, but he wrote about race, class and sexuality and what it was to be a black man in the United States. And he wrote that the great force of history comes from the fact we carry it within us. Our history is literally present in all that we do and in many ways unconsciously. It wasn't until the 1800s that, well, until the 1800s, drugs and plants were available to Canadians and legal to all consumers. And people use these plants and drugs to manage their health, to reduce pain. And as today, people use plants for pleasure, cultural and spiritual use. So early on in Canada, there was no distinction between medical or non-medical use of drugs or categories of legal or illegal drugs. It's argued that opium, alcohol, tobacco, these drugs were embedded in social customs in Western nations and rarely were drugs like opium or heroin or morphine associated with criminal activities. But there were larger social and cultural um, changes taking place around the world. And one of them was the Protestant ethic, which was an adoption of sobriety and self-control as sort of the template of white Christian middle-class respectability. And with colonization of what is now known as Canada came these ideas about 
sobriety, and self-control. And these were brought to us by white settlers. Well, white supremacy, racial stereotyping of indigenous and black and Chinese Canadians and defending the white nation against demonized foreigners were central themes of advocating for drug control in Canada. Originally, we just criminalized the smoking of opium and ignored the copious amounts of liquid opiums that white settlers consumed. Our focus was on criminalizing Chinese Canadians. But later we added other drugs to our concerns, such as the non-medical use of cocaine, heroin, and other drugs. And in Canada, drug control from the 1900s on has been primarily a criminal justice approach. And we've seen more and more drugs added to the drug schedule and police budgets and police powers expanding over the years. So law-abiding people became criminalized overnight as we enacted harsher and harsher drug laws over the century. So our drug laws are not based on evidence of harm, Rather, there are social control mechanisms in large part to profile poor, indigenous, and black people in Canada. And I want to point out that drug offenses in Canada early on in its inception and even today, that it's drug possession offenses that make up the majority of all our drug offenses each year. Meanwhile, while we criminalize drugs, we fail to set up any type of drug treatment or drug substitution programs in Canada. Rather, prison um, was a destination for poor and working class people and deportation of Chinese Canadians in the early 1900s. And when treatment was finally established, publicly funded treatment, it was abstinence-based treatment which failed most people, regardless of the fact that a lot of people in Canada didn't have access to this. And it was established in the 1960s and 70s and on. So I'll just end with saying that throughout Canada's history, it's enacted some of the most punitive drug laws of any Western nation with still life imprisonment as a maximum penalty for drug trafficking. And the drug dealer has been vilified in support of harsher sentences with little recognition of the fact that the majority of arrests and convictions are for drug possession and without recognizing that we haven't expanded harm reduction or safer supply programs in any meaningful way. But as we all know, and am referred to this, there's been resistance and right from the 1950s, but really gathering strength in the 1990s when we experienced our first overdose death crisis. And these resistance movements have had a huge impact and continue to do today because it's those most affected and their allies who are demanding change, um, especially at this moment when we see overdose deaths. Um, rising since the COVID policies came into place. I'm going to leave it at uh, there, but I just want to say that our ideas about people who use drugs, our ideas about addiction, about the addict are very flawed. And that when we think about ending prohibition in its entirety, we have to think about how race, class, gender, and sexuality intersect with these punitive policies and how drug policies shape child protection, um, child custody um, policies, drug treatment policies, and all of our ideas about people who consume drugs, whether they be legal or illegal. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Susan. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Garth Mullins to go next. Uh... Hey, uh, just trying to get my camera going. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. There we go. Hey, uh, sorry about that. You can see that I work in radio, right? Um, 
Yeah, my name is Garth Mullins, and I'm the host and executive producer of a podcast called Crackdown. Uh, we cover the drug war as drug users. Um, I've been on opioids my whole adult life, uh, heroin for a lot of it, and methadone more recently, although not strictly that. And um, probably half the people I came up with are gone now from two overdose crises. So there was one in the 90s that Am talked about just off the top, you know, a publicly declared health emergency in the 90s that was uh, from strong heroin, but also from the spread of uh, AIDS uh, amongst drug users and uh, other and everybody. Um, but Vancouver was uh, had the highest rates in the industrialized world back in the day. So we had a dual public health emergency of a virus and an unregulated drug supply. And if that sounds familiar and weird, we're having a dual crisis again. And it's, it's incredible to think that I'm living through a second one. Uh, and as the pandemic got going, we're really able to see what a public health response actually looks like. So I've I've dreamed of this. You know, I thought when you declare an emergency, when a government declares an emergency, that means it gets to do extra things. It gets to take extra measures. It can even, um, you know, uh, abrogate people's rights in, in, in a case of an emergency. But uh, not for us. Um, there was no uh, great sense of urgency for drug users. But when uh, COVID came, you know, they shut the borders, they closed the economy, they spent loads of money, the deficit no longer mattered. You didn't hear people talking about budgets. Um, we never had a moment like that with the overdose crisis. And in BC, so many thousands more people have died from overdose than from COVID. Uh, and I think those big drastic measures for COVID-19 are, are well warranted. You know, I, I think that we should have uh, officials that are looking out for uh, the public health. Um, but seeing these two things happen at the same time uh, was really disconcerting to us because we realized if the government wanted to, they could really um, take measures. And for us, for drug users, they don't have to shut down the border and shut down the economy. Uh, they can make it pretty simple. And so we've been saying this for some time, that it's uh, unequal treatment because the wrong people are dying. And it turns out that Horrigan, uh, the premier of British Columbia, John Horrigan, uh, knows exactly what we're talking about because last Thursday – he said this, and I'll just I'll just give you a full quote because I know um, that that only bits of it were said. So Oregon was asked about the difference between our government response to the pandemic and to uh, the overdose crisis, and he said, "I just think these two are these are two separate things. We have an insidious virus that affects anyone at any time, and on the other hand, he says, and we have an opioid crisis that involves people using drugs. Those are choices initially." And they become dependencies. Wash your hands, physical distancing, wear a mask if you can do that. These are conscious decisions that people can make to protect themselves. But when you're addicted to opioids, you're not making conscious decisions other than getting your next opioid. And those are the issues that we need to intervene in. So the premier, uh, NDP premier was talking exactly like Stephen Harper used to talk. Same ideas in his head as Jason Kenney. Of course, he's apologized since then. But, uh, you know, you get these rare moments where you hear a politician speak truth, and that was it. He, that's what he thinks. And, uh, you know, I haven't heard him actually speak about the opioid crisis uh, before then since uh, the election campaign. So the, the premier doesn't really care. And Dean Wilson, who's been a longtime uh, harm reduction activist, told me in 2017, he said, uh, Garth, the NDP never did fuck all for drug users. And uh, I, I always vote NDP. I vote left. I'm a socialist. Um, and I have to admit, he's, he's right. And I'm not saying that um, the BC Liberals would do any better. They would be worse. But um, for me, this is, man, I got to light a fire. You know, sparks fly out of Horgan's mouth. I got to pour gasoline around. That's the job of a drug user activist. Because the things we really need, safe supply and decriminalization, don't come from people who hold those ideas in their head. Uh, they don't come from leaders who are stuck in the Harper mentality about this sort of stuff, who are doing a moral calculus on who's a deserving person and who's a non-deserving person. So to stop the overdose crisis, um, we need a safe supply. And that means if people are doing 
uh, fentanyl or heroin or rock. There is a pharmaceutical version of all of those things that is of a known purity, uh, known ingredients uh, created under sterile conditions. And that's what people need to be able to access. Um, right, right now, we've made incremental steps with BC and prying a few other kinds of pills, which are distant cousins of, of heroin or opioids uh, from, from the rules. But um, those things that, that are sort of the direct, um, the direct pharmaceutical versions of the things people do right now, the things that are killing people because they're contaminated, those are not available to us. And um, this answer has been known for a very long time. In fact, I remember in the 90s when the idea of a safe injection site first came up. And this is um, a fight that was going on for a long time before Insight opened. In fact, activists uh, who eventually formed the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users opened safe injection sites illegally without permission first. And that's how come we have Insight and other safe injection sites. People always have to take the civil disobedience, the, the rule-breaking approach to get a government embarrassed enough to allow the actual thing. But in the original vision of that, it wasn't just that you come in and you would get a, a, a new, you know, a new syringe and um, a clean place to, to, to do your hit. You'd also get uh, clean and safe drugs. We, we thought heroin prescribing could happen at these places. And that vision is more than 20 years old, I guess 25 years old, perhaps. And so it's a good reminder that <clears throat> activists have to keep articulating the vision in front of the, uh, you know, the officials. And, <clears throat> you know, if we'd been able to do that, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, so that, that demand uh, continues and we continue to struggle and push for it. Ultimately though, uh, a regime where drugs are legalized is, is what we need. I think we learned just about everything we need to know from, from alcohol prohibition about how this works out. And so really is in my mind, is just how many more thousands of people have to die before we arm twist the government into allowing this to happen. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me, Am and uh, SFU organizers, and uh, cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Garth. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Angel to speak next. Uh... Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so... My name is Yutis Ajad, which means headstrong woman. I'm from the Haida Nation. Angel is my colonial name. Um, I'm here because uh, I was invited, and also because I am an um, I am a lived I have a lived experience. I am an active drug user, um, but I'm so much more than that, um, you know. And so are the people out here. So I'm um, um, this whole um, sorry I'm trying to read, read everything. I was listening to what everybody had to say, and it was all really great. So I was trying to. Just remember some little points I wanted to add to them too. But um, if you look like um, way, way back to when they, we had the alcohol prohibition, I don't know how many people know this, but there was a pandemic during that time too. Um, and so they were striving for a safe supply back then. Um, you know, eventually, you know, obviously we have alcohol that's legal. Um, so I think um, I just wanted to mention that actually. And um, as an Aboriginal woman downtown, or well, as an Aboriginal person, period, I can, I, you know, I, I can see the majority of the people passing here are actually, they're Native, they're Aboriginals, so they're out um, disproportionately, um, yeah, anyways, um, accounted for. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm really trying to read these little ones. Oh, yeah, I think the and they're not asking us like nobody ever asks us what we need, you know, like the government's not coming and saying well what is it you think you need to better the situation like, you know, I think the best people for the job are us. You want to you want to know what we need like we told you we needed a safe injection site. They didn't help we did it, it was just like Garth was saying. Um, you know, but, and we need them and look at there's nobody's ever died in our in our safe injection sites we've we've kept people alive. You know, um, and now they have this, um, you know, with the pandemic, they've gone to great measures for public health. Um, and that's all fine and good. And I, I think we did a really good job in BC. However, um, downtown and uh, drug users 
are dying so fast and so and I think a lot of that has to do with barring of um, guests in the SROs. A lot of the people that I, I know that use drugs that I, I want to help, um, they come to my house to use drugs because they know they have a buddy there that's going to keep them safe, that's going to have a Narcan kit with her, you know, and they, they depend on me. And I, I would imagine a, a lot of people depend on people like myself that actually have a place for them to go and be safe and they're not allowed in. And it's not because it's honestly, I'm sorry, guys, it's not for, it's not for anyone else's safety, but their own that work there because we're going out, we're still socializing, we're sharing things, we're coming home, you know, they're not really, they're not really safe that way anyway. Like we're still going to come back and do our thing. I mean, that's what I've seen. That's what I've seen it being. Um, you know, so I, I just think everything went against, it just went against the people that need, need help the most this whole, through this whole pandemic, you know, like, um, the overdose crisis and it just drives me nuts because there was we were dying fast enough before the pandemic i lost like i was going to three funerals in a weekend at one point and now i've just lost three people again last week so like i'm 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 tired of seeing my people die and i say my people my people the downtown east side these are my people like i love these people i need these people you know and i think we bring a lot of class and, and good stuff to this to the to vancouver it's you know we bring some color um, you know, and we're dealing with so much right now with like, it's crazy, like with social, social justice issues, like there's a revolution starting and then we've got police brutality all over the place. And, and, um, you know, I think it's pretty, uh, we do need a safe supply. I, I'm really tired of just watching people die. I mean, you know, I can't take it anymore. I'm starting to really, you know, it was already there. I don't want to become numb to anything, you know? I think people just need to know where people to, you know, I live downtown, I have three kids, I work, you know, I have a dog, I'm chubby, you don't look like, you know, like I'm totally, and I use drugs and I'm not really ashamed of it. I do what I have to do. And, you know, if we could come out of the shadows and stop hiding, less of us would be dying, you know? So it would be great to have a safe supply so our people could live. So I think that's really what I wanted to say. I'm not sure if, if I answered any questions, but anyway, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Angel. And I'm going to ask uh, Mark Lishishin to uh, go next. Uh, Mark, I hope you're, oh, there you are. Hi there, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me here. So I'm the Deputy Chief Medical Health Officer for Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, the overdose emergency is one of the main uh, public health issues that I've traditionally worked on. and in the context of this COVID pandemic, you know, essentially all of our public health resources were directed uh, towards the pandemic. And, you know, now as we sort of emerge from the first wave, we are really seeing some of the harms that that has caused. Um, you know, I think reflecting back on it, this really reveals to us that we've really done nothing uh, to address the root cause of the overdose emergency, which is of course the toxic unregulated drug supply and the, the drug supply remains just as unregulated as it was um, when we declared the, uh, the emergency around overdose. And what we're seeing now with the drug supply uh, shouldn't be unexpected to us. You know, there probably are factors that have been caused by the pandemic, you know, closure of the borders and, you know, change of manufacturer from abroad to local and, you know, maybe less, um, people are maybe less familiar with how to make fentanyl locally. And that's why we're seeing higher concentrations of fentanyl. We've also had this trend of seeing increasing benzodiazepines uh, contaminating opioid samples. And so, uh, you know, the, the drug supply is toxic right now, but it's been toxic the whole time. And uh, I think that's what's been so dangerous about the drug supply. It's been toxic and it's variable and completely unpredictable. And, and so it's acting that way right now. So, uh, so we, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be surprised, I guess. But I think we had developed some interventions that were helping to prevent deaths. And um, we've had trouble um, both delivering those interventions and also having people come and use those interventions uh, during the pandemic. And I'm talking about overdose prevention sites and supervised consumption sites. Um, 
you know, these have been incredibly effective interventions uh, to keep people alive. And, um, you know, in our region, we operate about 10 overdose prevention sites and three supervised consumption sites. And we supervise about 10,000 consumption events every week, typically. But during the pandemic, um, we're seeing about half of those visits. Um, and uh, so wherever those other visits are happening, uh, you know, hopefully they're happening um, with somebody else present. Hopefully that person has an naloxone kit. Hopefully, um, you know, something is happening to keep people safe, but it, it's not as safe as those supervised settings where, where um, you know, nobody ever dies of an overdose. And so that's been a real challenge for us in the initial days of the lockdown, many of those sites closed down and we worked really quickly to get them open. You know, we had to do a lot of infection prevention and control training because the sites hadn't really had that before. And uh, we did manage to get them open and now all of the sites are open. In fact, they were open within um, weeks of the lockdown, but the, the, the clients have not really come back in the same degree. Like everybody else in the world, they're afraid of getting COVID. Um, and, uh, and, and they just haven't returned to the services. So we hope that we can, you know, we're, we're trying to change the services, move some of them outside to bigger environments so that people will feel co more comfortable, but we really need to get people back to those supervised spaces. We also saw much fewer people coming to emergency rooms for overdose, despite the deaths uh, going up. Um, you know, we saw much fewer people coming to emergency rooms for any reason during the pandemic. Um, you know, people were afraid of getting COVID at emergency rooms, and so they weren't coming. And so for that reason, we think they were also not calling 911. We think people were also less likely to observe overdoses during the pandemic because nobody was on the street. And even if people did observe overdoses during the pandemic, they were less likely to help people because for fear of getting COVID from the victim. Uh, and so we think that's played a big role. We're also concerned about the policies that Angel talked about. You know, we've always been concerned about the restrictive guest policies and uh, supportive housing, and those policies became even more restrictive during the pandemic. And so, you know, how can you use drugs uh, with somebody else if you can't bring people into your room to do that? And so, so we've we've been concerned about that as well. And so. Um, we have been able to make, I guess, a little bit of progress towards safe supply. You know, it's, it's hard even to describe it that way because it is such a tiny step, but the government did allow us to put, push through these risk mitigation guidelines that allowed prescribing of um, some pharmaceutical alternatives to street drugs to people during the pandemic so that they wouldn't have to um, leave their homes or come out of isolation in order to get street drugs. But you know, of course, the alternatives are not really acceptable. And, um, and although some people are using them, and we, we think it is probably helping people, it's just, uh, you know, too little too late, um, you know, and, and not enough. So, um, and then in terms of the response and what was different, you know, uh, whenever we try to do anything around the overdose emergency, all we face is barriers. So we propose, you know, loosening restrictions around OAT. We propose expanding IOAT. We try to find different sites to deliver tablet um, injectable opiate agonist therapy programs. We start to start giving opiate agonist therapy at or injectable opiate agonist therapy at Insight. And we try to establish safe supply programs, but we just run into barriers from the different regulatory colleges, from the government, from all kinds of things. And um, that's the main work of working on the overdose is trying to overcome those massive barriers. Um, but in the case of pandemic, those barriers were not really present. And in fact, most of uh, the government and the public was willing to do more than was actually necessary to control the virus. And we all spent a lot of our time trying to pull back what people were doing, for instance, closing facilities that we thought never needed to be closed or closing public bathrooms or doing things like that that we, we thought would, would cause more risk, but that people wanted to do more. Um, and I think the reason really is because they felt that the the, the, the virus could affect them personally and they, they feel that to a lesser degree with the overdose crisis. And I think, um, I think that's really too bad. So um, yeah, maybe I'll end there. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mark. Uh, I'm gonna start with a couple of questions and also get to some uh, audience questions as well that have, people have uh, put in the in the chat box. But I'm just gonna begin, you know, when, when Insight opened uh, in the early uh, 2000s, it was kind of a compromise because what people were really pushing for was uh, safe supply. So there was still street drugs being uh, brought into that context. There have been studies like Naomi and 
uh, Salome, where uh, they're, 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 um, uh, the, the sort of medical research studies have been done, but the expansion of the safe supply runs into these regulatory uh, hurdles, as you mentioned. I'm just wondering if, if um, those of you on the panel could maybe just speak to, if there was one or two things that the government could do right now to change the facts on the ground that would benefit uh, people uh, who are uh, drug users, what are some of your policy ideas that you would uh, put forward? So if any of you want to jump in, maybe I'll just start with Susan first. I would immediately expand heroin assisted treatment and make it a more flexible program right now when we have Crosstown Clinic and a clinic in Surrey providing that. Um, I would also rethink why does someone have to be diagnosed as having opioid use disorder in order to receive um, IOD or OAT. And this is because we have no conception of a recreational or occasional user or weekend user. We have these ideas about addiction and the addict that are really faulty. Um, and I think we need to have a larger discussion. I know that doesn't do anything overnight, but a larger discussion on the idea that when people use regularly, we don't need to criminalize or pathologize that. And ultimately, I'd like to see us decriminalize personal possession, but I don't want us to then just focus on drug traffickers as a um, Canadian police chief have just recommended because oftentimes people who use criminalized drugs sell a bit of drugs in order to support their own use or they pool money with friends in order to buy. So I think that's really an avenue we shouldn't pursue. Um, but certainly um, I think decriminalizing personal possession is vital as long as we continue to have the conversation of dismantling prohibition in all of its entirety um, and to keep up the conversation about resistance, social justice, that people who are the most affected should be at the table creating this policy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Garth, did you want to jump in on this uh, question? If, if you had some policy ideas that you think would have immediate impact on the ground? Sure. I mean, one of the one of the things of this talk was to compare COVID and and overdose crisis, and so I, I agree with what Susan just said. And one of the reasons the government has told me that we can't expand heroin assisted treatment is because we can't get the heroin. Uh, I mean, I, I said to them, I can I could help, but uh, <laughs> it, actually, and that's not even true. It's very rare right now to find real heroin. But they mean, and we mean, pharmaceutical grade diacetylmorphine. And it's true, there's kind of complicated reasons, but it's mostly the government won't just say, look, here's a couple million bucks to a pharmaceutical company, just start making it, right? There's pharmaceutical companies, you know, on the North Shore of Vancouver. Uh, my partner used to, my ex-partner used to work in one, uh, like on the assembly line there, you know, watching pills go by all the time. Uh, so like we, we know how to do this. And then in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Premier Horrigan said, well, you know, if we're short of masks, like PPE, you know, like N95s or whatever, we have the pulp and paper industry here. We'll just, damn it, we'll just make them in BC. So, you know, the government was even willing to say, we'll make it, we'll make this thing that's needed. Um, but they, they don't put the same urgency. So we need a, a, you know, a national strategic heroin reserve. We need governments just like in World War II and just like they were proposing to do in COVID to actually lean in and say, yeah, we'll, will have this thing manufactured here. I mean, that's one simple thing. On decriminalization and cops, um, you know, Horgan's gaslighting everybody by saying he's writing to Trudeau to ask for decriminalization. And Trudeau isn't ready and doesn't want to do it. And this is like a classic Canadian pastime of point to the other level of government. I'm fucking so tired of this, man. And what he's got to do is he's reviewing the police act right now. And this isn't even a radical proposal. Bonnie Henry said, amend the police act to make sure that um you know drug users don't get harassed for possession or whatever uh by the cops don't get arrested and uh horgan said he won't do that but you know he's he's made this committee to review it the special committee to review the police act even instructed them uh not to do it so he's got to turn around on that but uh that's a lot of gaslighting from from one guy right now um but uh, you know i also agree with susan that we don't want uh a police chief's written 
drug policy, right? So when when um, Adam Palmer, the the chief of police of the Vancouver Police Department, goes out in, with all the other chiefs of police and says, oh, "Okay, we're for decriminalization," also asking Trudeau, a guy who doesn't want it, and they know it. Um, we got to be suspicious because this guy could have been implementing de facto decriminalization himself, and the VPD could have since the last crisis. They have chosen not to. They're still chasing people around. So, uh, you know, if he wants to go have a uh, a system that relies on, um, you know, ticketing and and people not meeting uh, conditions, um, you know, like red zoning we've had for a long time, then yeah, that's what you're going to get. So don't let police chiefs write your drug policy. Thank you, uh, Garth. Uh, Angel, did you want to jump in on this uh, question? If you have any policy ideas in terms of uh, how things would uh, uh, be supportive of, of drug users in the neighborhood that would make things safer on the, on, in the, on the ground. Oh, uh, Angel, I think you're on mute. Sorry, I think decriminalizing um, possession first and foremost, obviously that's that's important. Um, I think them better pay for the um, frontline workers and the, the peer frontline workers working in the opioid or in the in, the, in safe injection sites. And I think um, making it so that safe injection sites are open 24 hours uh, with safe safe like with um, clean gear and uh, and whatever, I think that would have really, that would be a really good step towards helping. Um, then people like myself, they wanna keep you know, barring gas. We wouldn't have to worry so much if there was somewhere for people to go. Um, and also maybe remove that, that uh, condition off of the SROs um, and give us a right back, our rights back. And yeah, but first and foremost, decriminalizing the possession and also, like Susan's and really watching out for um, for how you're doing that with uh, with because there's people that do sell drugs that are only selling drugs just to get their own to keep their own habit going, not to get rich. So, thank, yeah, you. thank you, uh, Mark. Did you want to jump on this? You're you're working inside of a bureaucracy, uh, yeah. Vancouver uh, Coastal Health, and you certainly see regulatory and policy things get in the way of uh, public health outcomes that everybody wants. And I think it'd be really interesting to get your take on what uh, could be moved on really quickly that would change things on the ground. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know if it's quick, but Canada knows how to dec how to legalize uh, illegal drugs. You know, we've just gone through that process uh, with cannabis, and I think it's actually been quite successful. Um, so, you know, we really, we have the model to do it. And, you know, now we have to do it with the drugs that are actually harming people instead of the ones that aren't. Um, but, you, you know, because the, the kind of safe supply programs that are being proposed will never be sufficient because we don't have the pharmaceutical alternatives to all of the drugs. And so we need to create safe versions of all the drugs. It's really the only acceptable thing. Um, but if we're not doing that, then we do need to work on the safe supply programs and the kind of barriers that we're running into is the only kind of model that seems to be acceptable to people right now is one where there is individual physician prescribing. And, you know, we think with the right protocols and the right assessments and things like that, that that wouldn't be necessary, that you would be able to come into a program where they have the protocol and they do a nursing assessment or, or a peer assessment, and then they kind of move them through the safe protocols that have been developed. And uh, that you know, but that's just not acceptable to kind of governments right now. And so the only models that are being, you know, being considered are this individual <coughs> physician prescribing uh, a medication. Uh, and then, you know, the, the options of what drugs are being provided are extremely limited. And, you know, that limits who even wants to be part of the program, um, you know, because uh, they, they just can't have uh, the options they want. So there needs to be, you know, all of the pharmaceuticals need to be available, just like when you're in a hospital, uh, the physician can prescribe any of the medications to you that you need. Um, that should also be the case in safe supply programs. But um, just to kind of respond to what Garth was saying, I mean, the main barrier to injectable opiate agonist therapy programs um, in the province is really the cost of those programs. I don't think it's about the logistics of importing heroin in from Switzerland or developing uh, you know, local production um, in a pharmaceutical com company here. I, I think it's really about the cost uh, that it takes to have a program and you know, to prescribe that, that medi injectable medication to somebody on a daily basis, it is expensive, but 
again, the cost argument doesn't really make sense because we, of course, spend lots of money in the healthcare, uh, you know, area on patients to have transplants and to have all kinds of things. And so cost doesn't seem to be a barrier for some conditions, but seems to be uh, an insurmountable barrier uh, for other conditions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's a number of questions that have come in on the chat. I'm just going to read uh, three or four and then uh, come back to any of you if you have a comment on any one of those. Um, uh, what did the speakers feel about the defund the police debate? Would that help the community feel safer? Uh, a question uh, as well, would a government appointed ombudsman be an authorized coordinator to anticipate, get around, modify barriers to be more efficient, effective uh, with plans? Uh, what is Vancouver's role in ensuring the rest of BC has their needed drug related services, the rest of Canada? How can people assist in lobbying the government? So we have a lot of people that are mobilized on this call and, and really wanna help out and be supportive of this movement. Uh, how, what can uh, people do to support? Uh, maybe I'll start with you, uh, Susan. If you wanna answer any of those. <laughs> I guess I'll start with the first one, the defund the police. I think we need to look at just how policing is organized and constructed in Canada, you know, all levels of law enforcement to look at those budgets, to then look at our budgets for housing and social supports, um, you know, uh, annual incomes for Canadians, those kind of issues are important. Um, you could defund the police, but they're still practicing in ways where they're racial profiling, poor and black and indigenous people, people who use drugs. So I think more than defunding has to occur, but certainly if we put more of our tax dollars into social supports and providing um, safer supply and harm reduction programs, sanctioning uh, heroin, compassion clubs, testing of drugs while we move through this transition, all of that would be uh, worthwhile. And yeah, I think lobbying your politicians and the government is always a good thing, you know, um, to be verbal and to resist what's going on and to provide alternative, um, alternatives to what the status quo has become, because really, um, it's unfathomable in a certain way how we could allow so many people to die when these are preventable deaths in relation to the overdose um, crisis. Yeah, one thing uh, that, that comes up for me is in the late 90s when the public health emergency was declared, the Vancouver Agreement was signed where the three levels of government were partners and additionally the health authority and the police uh, became signatories. So there's a way to uh, talk past those silos a little bit to come up with some workable solutions. Those cause problems and they lose their uh, bureaucratic inertias uh, over time, but you haven't had similar types of uh, agreements in the context of these health emergencies. So I'm going to pass it over to, to Garth if you wanted to weigh in on any of those questions. Sure, I'll be quick. Defund the police? Hell yes. Uh, <laughs> government approved ombudsman? Uh, uh, no. uh, Vancouver role in helping the rest of BC? I mean, people got to organize wherever, wherever they are, they got to organize. Drug users got to get together, form a union, organize. Like, I don't think everybody else wants Vancouver like vansplaining the solutions, especially when we haven't found them or we haven't been able to win them. You know, we've been able to make some incremental gains, but uh, we're still far away here. So maybe Vancouver ought not to be <laughs> telling anybody else how to do their business. And then the last thing, how can people help? Uh, the most immediate thing I can think of is if you're in Vancouver, on the 15th of August at noon, come to Maine and Hastings. We're having a rally for all of the people that we've lost. Um, but it's not just uh, mourning, it's um, angry and fighting back. And, um, you know, we're still discussing what the most appropriate civil disobedience action to take on that day will be, but uh, that's, uh, that's kind of trying to recover some of that uh, radical fighting history. So yeah, come, come to that. Uh, Angel, did you wanna weigh in on any of these questions? Yeah, um, uh, I think as far as defunding the police, that's a touchy one. I'm, I'm like, um, not about the police at all, don't get me wrong. I think that like we should really be focusing on like what kind of calls they make. Like police are needed. We couldn't police ourselves. There would be absolute like chaos in the world if the, you know, um, we go into anarchy really. Um, I think we need them, but 
we need health, we need health professionals, mental health professionals to go and answer mental health calls. Police need to take uh, sensitivity training, cultural uh, sensitivity training, and they should have to um, do a week or two or even a month in the, living in one of the SROs in the downtown east side and getting to know the people, or at least once a week doing something to get to know the people um, because they suck right now and they're not doing very well. Um, <laughs> thing, you know, I don't know. Um, and then uh, I don't know about the ombudsman thing. Um, I think, uh, so yeah, there's somebody, um, decriminalization and safe supply are the way to go. Um, and remembering that people are like, at the, the, that's why I think police have to take trauma, professional, um, professional sensitivity training is because, and professional ethics something, um, is because they're not looking at the whole picture of the person. A lot of people that are doing drugs are traumatized people and they grow up and, you know, they're, they're, that's what they're using drugs for. And so they're hurting people that are already hurting. They're beating the crap out of them. I see it every day up there, I mean, in Hastings. So yeah, that's that. Thank you. Yeah. Mark, did you want to weigh in on any of those questions? Sure. Well, I, I'm going to agree with Angel that we, we have to change the way that police do their work or change even who police are. Um, I agree that many of the situations they're responding to are mental health situations. They admit that they feel completely unprepared to, re to respond to them. And so we, we need to change it so that the police are not all police officers and that there are mental health workers and social workers that are part of police forces and that they work together um, you know, with the more security elements of the police when they're needed. No, Garth is saying no. Um, anyways, but um, I, I don't know. I think we have to change the people that are responding to the problems. Um, and and um, the issue of the ombudsman, I, I would say we essentially have that now. You know, we they created this Minister of Mental Health and Addictions and created this very, very small ministry that she would be in charge of, um, yet she is not in charge of healthcare funding, uh, even for programs related to mental health and addictions. So we have somebody who's sort of a figurehead who can advocate for things, but with no budget behind her to like implement programs. And so we find that to be one of the major barriers that we run into in the healthcare system. It's still the Ministry of Health that controls all the funding for healthcare programs. And that's uh, just a, you know, a huge problem. Uh, it allows the Minister of Health not to feel responsible for this problem because there's another minister who, who is responsible for it. And um, we don't really get any progress. Um, in terms of the Vancouver, you know, in Vancouver, we have been able to to develop and implement and research harm reduction interventions that they've not been able to do in other parts of Canada. And so I think it, it is our responsibility to implement those programs when we can and to study them and to publish the results. And that you know, has definitely been very important around all the research that was done around Insight. Uh, more recently, we developed drug checking as an intervention that could play a role in the overdose emergency and it's been adopted across Canada and across other places. Um, you, you know, so 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 I, I think it is our role to do to to do harm reduction, to do research around it, and to you know help give other give, give ideas to other places. Now, I agree with Garth that the Vancouver downtown east side solution is not the solution for every community, um, but there are ideas there that 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 can be used and and have been adopted. And now, particularly with overdose prevention sites, I think we're seeing um, you know there is the insight model, but this can be done differently in different places where there are different needs, where different people are involved. And we've seen a lot of um, kind of specialization in overdose prevention services um, when you don't have such a heavy regulatory regime on top of you that doesn't allow you to make changes. So you know we've seen women's only overdose prevention services, overdose prevention services in hospitals. We've seen them in rural areas um, you know so we're seeing a lot of innovation around things that were initially kind of studied in Vancouver. Uh, one of the questions that came in uh, sort of uh, clearly is a, a province-wide issue and with uh, so many people uh, dying the effects on loved ones uh, parents uh, sisters brothers friends uh, what are the supports that are available uh, uh, for people who are uh, impacted uh, by the deaths uh, that happen. And, and there was another question around what, what is the distinction between decriminalization and legalization? So if somebody could weigh in uh, on that, I'll maybe just start with uh, uh, Susan again. Okay, I'll start with the um, 
decrim legalization. Um, if we decrim simple possession, that leaves the whole drug trade um, still intact. And so it means that people are still receiving or buying drugs from an illegal market, which is unregulated. And as we know with the overdose uh, death crisis, that drugs sold on the legal market, we don't know the quality of those drugs and often they have adulterations in them. Um, and that's why people, um, you know, overdose from these drugs because they don't know the quality of the drug. So it leaves that whole, and it, it leaves in some ways this sort of punishment industry intact as well um, around ideas about good and bad drugs and importation and production of drugs intact. Decriminalization just means that you're not gonna be criminalized for this small personal possession. It would mean a lot. I'm not trying to um, make less of that. I mean, even in BC um, or in Vancouver, our latest drug stats, crime stats, 72% of all drug offenses were for possession. So it would you know, be quite vital to decriminalize possession of drugs. But it's to say it really doesn't get rid of the, a larger issue, um, which is access to safe drugs and sort of a questioning of global prohibition, national prohibition. In terms of groups, oh, you know, one that springs to mind, of course, are all the drug user unions that exist throughout Canada and British Columbia itself, but also the mothers' organizations, um, uh, Mothers Against Prohibition, um, that exist too. And I refer to those groups because those are people who themselves have um, experience in relation to the use of drugs, but also experience in relation to loss and death, in relation to our policies. Um, and as Angel said, see themselves as not just drug users. Uh, there are people who have been impacted negatively by our drug policies, but they're obviously um, engaged in all other types of life like everyone else is who isn't using criminalized drugs. Thank you, uh, Susan. We're, we're running out of uh, time, but I'm going to give uh, the rest of the panelists uh, one minute each to wrap up or weigh in on this uh, question. I'll go over to you, Garth. I don't know what to tell you about supports for grief. It's been fucking me up lately. Like I, I'm carrying it around like a stomach full of concrete. I don't I don't know what to do. I mean, I, I'm the last person to give advice on this, really. I've been just uh, cramming it all down there and sort of trying to numb it out. So um, yeah, don't listen to me about that. Uh, but do listen to me about defunding the police because uh, really, like the police have to be defunded. You, we have to recreate society. We have a society that was built on a whole bunch of racist institutions, a whole bunch of capitalist institutions. If we want to get rid of the drug war, if we want to transform systemic things, it, it doesn't just mean absent one institution. Like we're not just saying minus the police it's saying, take some of the functions that we, we think of when we think of the police and do them with somebody else, do them in a different way. You start cutting that all down. You see what's left, see what nobody else can do. And I bet you, you're going to find a little sliver. You start changing other things in the world. That sliver disappears too. No more cops. Thanks for having me. And thanks everybody. Thank you, uh, Garth. Uh, Angel, over to you. That'd be a great world, no more cops. <laughs> um, I can't tell you either, um, like Garth, I'm, I deal with my grief by my writing or by um, doing work on my, you know, in my groups or whatever it is that I'm doing. Like, um, I, I really, there's just so much of it. I, I know there's those mothers, mothers, um, groups that um, that um, Susan was talking about and um, Al-Anon, <laughs> I don't, I really don't, I don't know. All I know is for myself, I just I deal with it at home on my own and I stay close to my friends and that's how we do it. So. Yeah, Thank I, you. I would, I would agree. I would agree that the healthcare system really doesn't have the right supports for grief, for trauma, for pain. Um, it's very hard to get supports for any of those problems. 
Uh, you can get more if you have private insurance through work. That's where a lot of those supports are given, or you get some of some supports for these issues if you develop a mental illness because of them. Um, but again, like we shouldn't be waiting until people, uh, you know, develop illness to address the root causes. So I think that's really a problem. Um, but I would like to shout, you know, give a shout out to organizations like Mom Stop the Harm because I think turning your grief and your pain into advocacy is powerful. And I, I think that organization in particular has made a difference. Um, and I think when you can feel like you're part of the solution, it does help um, address some of the pain that you might be feeling. So I, I think that is actually a good ap approach to the problem, but not everybody will be at a stage where they're ready to do that. Thanks so much, uh, Mark. And I wanted to thank Susan, Garth, Angel, all of you for uh, sharing your stories and your perspective. This is an issue that's going to take sustained energy to move the dial on public policy. So really view this as the beginning of a set of conversations that are going to require focus and attention uh, to move the dial in a way that really does uh, shift uh, the facts on the ground. So thank you so much for taking part. I'm going to pass it uh, back to Doug uh, from Public Square. Thanks, so. uh, thank you all so much for joining us for this important conversation. Thank you, Am, for the great, great questions and moderation. Thank you, Angel, Susan, Mark, and Garth for your insights, stories, and calls to action. On behalf of the teams at SFU Public Square, City Hive, and the SFU Morris J. Waskin for Dialogue, thank you all of you for joining us today. Um, if anything, I think we've learned how much labor has been put into this work by drug user activists and allies for solutions to this crisis and the war on drugs, which affects everyone. And I hope everyone here can see that it will take sort of all of us for this change that we wanna see. And that as Anne has said, this will take many more conversations and action. Um, we'll be sending a follow-up email shortly after this with links and resources referenced in this conversation, as well as a short survey to help us adapt and improve these events. We also plan to share video clips of this and we saw that there was a lot of questions coming in. So we're gonna be doing our best to follow up on those and the comments. Uh, please join us next week for COVID-19 post-secondary education, one piece of advice from students. Uh, registration for that is now open if you check out our websites or social media and uh, we'll be dropping a link for that in the chat. And we'll keep this Zoom meeting open for another 10 to 15 minutes for a chat, but the event proper is open now. So please enjoy your lunch, enjoy your day, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> thank you, everyone.